Sure. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to our presentation today on bystander intervention. We're going to be having a discussion about what this is, what it looks like, and how you can do it in your own life. I'm Liz. I work for Domestic Violence Services in Snohomish County, and I'm going to be leading this discussion. With me, I have my awesome friends and team. They work with me in the Prevention Education Department. I'll let them introduce themselves. Annie, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, my name is Annie. I am the North County Prevention Education and Outreach Coordinator, and I'm really excited to be here as a part of the conversation today. Olivia. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm the South County Prevention Coordinator, so basically Annie's copy in South County, <laughs> and I'm also excited <laughs> to be here. So, <laughs> Chris? <laughs> All right, and I'm... <laughs> My name is Chris McBride. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the director of programs with Domestic Violence Services of Snohomish County. I oversee a couple different departments, including this one, Prevention Education Outreach, and I am incredibly happy to be here with my team and even, even more proud of Annie for getting her title right, <laughs> right away. Like she didn't stumble at all. That was, yeah, that was well beautiful. done. Fifth time is the charm. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of bloopers. <laughs> So what's a bystander? What do you all, what have you all heard about bystanders? What do you know? It's somebody who is like witnessing a situation where there's a crisis or a form of danger or some sort of happening that would, might require like outside intervention. Yeah, it's a really good answer. Thanks. Any other ideas? I just cut, yeah, same thing. I just kind of think of people, like any person in a situation, like maybe there's not even like a crazy thing happening, but like there could be at any time. So then everybody around the situation becomes a bystander. So we're all bystanders and waiting. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we are all, we are all standing by. Yes. Ooh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. These are some really great answers. So a basic definition that we're going to be using today is that a bystander is someone who is present at an event or an incident, but they do not take part. So y'all hit that, that nail right on the head. Good job. So what about the bystander effect? Why don't we intervene? What is that? And what does that mean? I know it has something to do with uh, the assumption that someone else will take care of something, especially if there's a large group. Like if it's call 911, like everyone's like, well, certainly someone's going to call 911. We all heard a gunshot, like oh. asked to do it. It's not going to be me, though. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to like not conform to the group, but also yeah, there's the assumption of everyone's going to do it. And that's, I think in those situations, you're supposed to target a specific person and say like, you call, like, I think even beyond just being the person who's like, I'm going to call, like, it's also helpful to single someone out and say, you call is what I've heard. But that's, yeah, that's what I know. Yeah, I think I just would mimic the answers that were already shared. Um, we don't intervene because uh, because of a couple of things. Societally, we are taught not, and it depends on where you are and what your background is. But most society, mostly culturally, we are taught like not to intervene in certain situations because somebody else is going to have a better answer than the than what you might have in front of you. Um, especially if you're talking about an emergent event where somebody's life is in danger or there's a safety issue, not a lot, not a lot of people work in industries where it's easily discernible what the correct steps to take would be. And thus it creates like a, a frozen moment where we're waiting for somebody to tell us what to do, which comes to Olivia's point about identifying individuals to do certain tasks. Yeah. <laughs> Those are all really good answers. And like, you definitely hit on some of the main key aspects here. Um, yeah, the bystander effect essentially just means that the greater number of bystanders, the less likely it is for any one of them to provide help to a person in distress or to intervene. 
which is essentially what you all said. So good job. You know what that is. <laughs> but people are more likely to take action in a crisis when there are few or no other witnesses present, which is a really interesting idea because you think you'd want more help in the situation. And the bystander effect was popularized in the 60s and 70s by Bib Latane and John Darley in the, following this murder of Kitty Genovese in New York City. Um, so this woman, she was stabbed to death outside of her apartment and dozens of her neighbors, they were home, it was broad daylight and she was murdered. They heard what happened and nobody did anything. They didn't call 911, they did not come outside, they did not ask if she was okay. And she passed away in the end because of the lack of intervention here. And these two social psychologists simplifies this phenomenon. They've seen it in a number of places, they did a number of research studies on it, and they attributed it to two key social factors. And those are basically what you all hit upon. Diffusion of responsibility and social influence. And these are both pretty big aspects of conformity. So I love social psychology. That's like what I studied in school. And so this stuff is seen throughout history, throughout a number of studies. And it really comes down to just the root of how we interact with other people. So the diffusion of responsibility is this idea that when you're in a group of people, kind of what Chris was saying, like you're going to assume somebody's better at it. You're going to assume somebody's more qualified. And what Annie and Olivia are saying, that someone else will take action. And so if you don't say anything, if nobody's like, call 911, you go do this, you go grab this thing, we're going to assume somebody's automatically doing that because there's probably somebody out there who's more qualified to do these things. There's somebody who knows what to do in the situation. And then on top of that, we have the social influence aspect. So this idea that we're going to conform to the people around us innately. We want to follow what everybody else is doing because especially in those moments when it's that instinct is kicking in, that shock of like, oh my God, somebody is being hurt in front of me. You're relying on those gut feelings, those things that you've learned throughout your life. And those things can come up in a number of ways, but ultimately in the moment, you're looking at to see what everybody else is doing it. And so if everybody is diffusing the responsibility, if nobody is taking on ownership, they're assuming somebody else is going to do it, you don't know what to do. You're going to conform. You're going to say, okay, well, obviously somebody else has it. I'm just going to ignore this like everybody else is. There must not be something wrong with this situation, even if you think maybe there is. So when we think about this bystander effect, we want to be the people that intervene. We want to try and work past that, that social influence, those ways that we desire to conform to do what everybody else around us is doing and to rely on those social instincts might not necessarily be the wrong thing to do in that situation. And so when we think about how to intervene, we want to think of the different aspects of how to be engaged in that intervention. So we're going to talk about some of your options for how you can intervene. So here's some discussion points for all of us to go over to talk about. So this first one this topic is safety. So when it comes to intervention, why is safety important in an intervention? And what can you do if it isn't safe to intervene? We'll talk through each of these points. Uh, well, for the first one, I mean, it's important for you as the the not bystander, the intervening person, um, because obviously you want to be safe, but also like ultimately for the situation to get better, to get resolved, like you need to remain safe and able to help. Um, and then also like for the other person, maybe the person who's in danger in harm in that moment, um, you need to evaluate if your actions are going to actually make them safer or not and that might involve like thinking about it a little bit down the line like will there be repercussions for this if I do intervene right now what might that look like and that can be kind of hard in like in like a two second moment where you're trying to decide if you want to intervene or not um but I think it's the safety is important for both you and for both you and your personal safety and for the safety of the situation and your ability to help and for the person in the future potentially yeah when I actually uh, worked with youth. Um, there were a lot of times when we'd be the only staff on site and our general policy was that if there was like a fight between the youth, even if it was like really dangerous and we were really concerned for one of the other ones, we could not intervene because if we were harmed in that situation, then there would be no one in charge of like there'd be no responsible adult in the room. So we had to take a step back and get the police and have somebody else come to intervene because us putting ourselves in danger would be putting other like everyone else in danger as well. Is 
definitely great answers. Yeah, I think it's also really important to keep in mind with the work that we do specifically of like domestic violence and intimate partner violence that our safety is important in those situations. But at the same time, the safety of the other person, the person who is being harmed, we don't know what the repercussions are going to be. And so keeping that in mind, even if it's just something subtle that you see and you talk to them afterwards of like how you're going to intervene might be affected by the potential repercussions that they're going to be experiencing and their safety. But sometimes they're also, they're not in a safe situation and their safety is at, at risk of being compromised. And so they need someone to step in to help prevent that. So what can you do if it isn't safe to intervene? What are some other options? Get outside help. <clears throat> yeah. One thing that uh, pops to mind immediately about uh, if it's not safe to intervene, oftentimes the presence of another individual, not necessarily the actions, but just the mere presence of somebody, especially in DV situations, can be incredibly useful. Um, a lot of a lot of abusers, while and we're talking strictly an IPV lens at this point, intimate partner violence lens at this point. Um, but a lot of abusers, they hide under the, the auspice of anger management. But in truth, it's not anger management, right? Like it's this anger, this action is directed towards one individual and acting in such a way in public with somebody else there, regardless of what that other person is doing, isn't a possibility in most of these relationships because the control might might be lost if somebody does call the police that might involve outside influences so sometimes just not leaving a situation that you're uncomfortable with it, so long as you're acknowledging that it's safe in the first place can be really useful yeah definitely um and each of the other ways that we're going to be talking about kind of just general categories of interventions like Safety is definitely going to be playing a role in which one you choose and how you go about that. Because like you said, just having a presence there can be enough. And sometimes doing things like getting outside influence might escalate things. And so ensuring that you're just there to be a present, to be just a rock, like that can be enough sometimes. What might be some barriers to intervening for either yourself specifically, like something that you just know about yourself, or generally that maybe other people my experience or just a really basic level barrier? I can go ahead and give some examples. I like, or I say, Chris, I'm muted. Do you have some ideas? No, go ahead. Okay. So, I mean, one of the really basic ones, not basic, but like the ones that a lot of people might be experiencing that would prevent them from intervening and just be a barrier is trauma. If you've gone through something really hard, it could be really triggering for you to intervene in those situations and to be that person. You might not know what to do or how to help in that situation, and it might be more important to you in that moment to keep yourself safe. I think also, um, like, confusion and being uncertain the repercussions of your actions will be like if you intervene is that going to mean that in a domestic violence situation the abuser is going to take that out on their partner later is there going to be like saying you humiliated me you brought negative attention to us through your actions and is there going to, are you going to actually be putting that person into more danger by stepping in? Yeah, and like a little bit of a different note also for barriers, um, just for the, like, if you are debating whether to intervene or not, and if the intervention involves like bringing in outside forces, like maybe police or CPS or like anything like that, if you are of a group that like has historically been um, not treated well by those entities, like you might be nervous to like get into a situation where you're even like near them or like could be, um, I don't know, I could just see like some people maybe having some hesitation about around that, like calling the cops, for example, even if it is to like help someone else. That might well, be. Even, 
<clears throat> even to expand on that a little bit, um, I'm and you're absolutely, I, I agree a hundred percent. Like that would be an instant thing. But what one thing I was going to mention is <clears throat> um, not not having clarity on the laws that surround whatever's happening in front of you, right? So for for instance, let's take it out of the IPB fields, keeping DV in sight, and look at, <clears throat> excuse me, and look at uh, somebody hitting a child, right? So if somebody's hitting a child in public, there's some gray area in child in the child abuse laws, and everyone knows that there's weird gray area in these laws. We're all if we're part of culture, we're very aware that there's this space that feels like it shouldn't be legal and is, or feels like it should be legal, but isn't. There's, it's, it's nebulous. And thus, when we start, when we have this will to intervene, say in this situation, but this can be expanded elsewhere, we're not sure that A, we're intervening in a way that's legal, and B, we're not like if we intervene and something physical happens because of that, if if we're personally intervening, then potentially we are creating a legal issue for ourselves when there actually isn't one on the other end. And this isn't necessarily even sorry, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent go about for this, it. but it. this isn't even necessarily a bad thing to have in the back of our heads, because when we think about individuals who are doing this cross-culturally and calling the police or trying to intervene in places because they see a person of color parenting in a style that maybe they don't, and thus they're more inclined to call, we don't, that's not a great place for people to be coming from. So this inherent like worry about the legality of intervention sits at the top of our head. And it in some cases, that's a really good thing. We don't need to be calling the police all the time. We don't need to be intervening all the time. Uh, but there is this gray area that anytime we interact with somebody in a way that's confrontational, there's also the legal background that we that is nebulous to us. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point. All of these are really good points. I think kind of with what Olivia was getting at too, of like, if it's not safe for you to be calling the police in that situation, if it's not a good time for you to intervene, then what about also if the other person is somebody who's been historically like targeted by the police, if they're of those minority groups, of those demographics, there's a chance that things could escalate in a way that is not helpful to anybody in that situation, that is dangerous and ultimately harmful and just continues the cycle of racism. There's all these different ways. And even on top of this, some one barrier for you might be if you know the person. If this is somebody you care about, that you see hurting someone you know, or somebody that you care about is being hurt, that might be a barrier to saying something to helping them get the help they need to intervening because this is your social circle. These are the people that you care about. And that can be inhibiting and saying something and doing the thing that needs to be happen. Another one um, that I think is important to acknowledge too is reprisal on you yourself. We think about, especially if we know the person, inter intervention, like say it's heroic, say, say we know that the intervention is required. It is still okay to worry like, God, I don't, I don't want this person's anger to be directed towards me after all is said and done. That's a scary thought that like, that's inherently frightening. Uh, and a lot of people hope that they would still do what's right in that situation, I think. But if if they're not able to, that's okay. And that's a legitimate barrier. That's that's an absolutely okay fear to have in these situations, I think. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, like what are some realistic strategies to work through these sorts of barriers in those moments where you're worried about your safety, you're worried about doing the right thing or the consequences of intervening? What are some ways that maybe we can work through these, even if it's not in that moment, but learning from each incident for the future? Um, maybe if you're able to have a safe conversation with the person at a separate time, um, like before the next incident, if there is a next incident, like, hey, what would make you feel the most safe in this moment? If, if like, would you want me to jump in? Do you want me to not, right? Like kind of knowing 
from just their perspective, let them take the lead on like what would make them feel safest. So then you're then you don't have that that confusion moment and stress next time. Sorry, Annie took herself off mute right away and I keep waiting for her to, <laughs> to say something. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't take myself off mute. Oh, I, I just haven't been muted. Right. Wait, all did right. I? I don't know. Uh, yeah. I think all three of us were on mute and then you went right off mute. And I was like, oh, Annie's going to hop in. Cool. Can't <laughs> wait to hear what she has to say. But no, apparently she's just trying not to sneeze. Um, um, yeah, actually. <laughs> One thing that uh, that is taught is intervening from a de-escalation lens uh, as opposed to an escalation lens. So even in the, converse, the brief conversation we've had so far today, um, we've talked a lot about almost like either physical or, or uh, uh, structural escalation. So approaching potential intervention through a de-escalation lens can, if you have that training, can get you through some of these barriers because you're not instantly hopping up to some of our concerns about our own physical safety or the safety of the individual who either, uh, well, the safety of the individual working with um structural forces like the police so um that's one one method in which you can be a little prepared for intervention yeah definitely like seeking out those resources those opportunities to learn how to do that how to be that person in your community that's definitely a way to do that any other ideas totally okay if you don't have any. Uh, working through barriers, um, realistic strategies to working through barriers. Sorry, I thought I had one, but I guess I don't. I think, I think Annie working on obviously a different project is just throwing me way off. <laughs> yeah. Called out. The call out. The call out. <laughs> <clears throat> Not quite. Chris is intervening. <laughs> <laughs> We're practicing our intervention. I'm intervening. Yeah. <laughs> Annie, are you okay? <laughs> I was trying to Google this. Mm. I mean, yeah, like just to like be straightforward, like there's not going to be an easy cut answer for this. Like when it comes down to it, what works for one person isn't going to work for another person. And the reason that a lot of us struggle with interventions and the safety of it is that there aren't a lot of resources for working through this, for finding something that is helpful to yourself, because there isn't one size fits all when it comes to this. So I think taking the time and just working through what is preventing you, whether it's emotionally, physically, structurally, from intervening in certain situations, addressing that, thinking about why that's happening and what yeah. you can do. I think I would add on there also um, thinking through the situations beforehand is also a realistic strategy. So yeah. which person are you in, in situations of emergencies and mm -hmm. just kind of having that role set for yourself when the, when the circumstances happen, um, almost, almost a little bit of forward coping or future coping and having that role placed for yourself. So if, if you are somebody who feels very comfortable talking in front of a bunch of people, being the person to point and say, hey, make that call mm -hmm. um, could be useful or acknowledging where you're weak in, in these sorts of situations before you even become enter into the situation. Yeah, definitely. And we're gonna be going over some of those scenarios. And if you are watching this video in the future, hello, future you. Um, feel free to do that on your own. Like, think about what would you do in the situation and do some practice. And with that in mind, we're going to go over some of the really general ideas of the approaches you can take when it comes to interventions. And this is distract, direct, or delegate. And they're just three general types of actions that you can take. We're going to go over what we think that means, what it looks like in each of those situations. 
I also think it's important to note that you said hello future you, but you're actually saying hello to current them from oh. past you. Future oh. them isn't even involved. In I was that. thinking that too, but I was like, hello you in the future for me, but in your current present. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought about that and I also was like, Chris is definitely thinking about this right now. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I saw Chris thinking, I just, I didn't catch that. I was, yeah, I was- You were too busy Googling something else to get the full context. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, no. I heard, insurance forms. <laughs> I heard what was happening. I was just like- <laughs> I saw Chris you doing that. You couldn't switch your screen fast enough to see what people were talking about. Yeah, we yeah. can. 100%. Sorry, Annie. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> having fun with you. We did Olivia yeah. earlier. It's Annie's turn. <laughs> Annie just gets to do it on camera for all the future yous out there. Yes. <laughs> all the present yous, Olivia. Present yous. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. It's a good joke. God. <laughs> Okay. Ours was a joke too. We were playing off of the anyway. <laughs> so different types of interventions. <laughs> oh my gosh. So the first one we have we're going to talk about is distract. So what are some distractions basically? I'll just go over this really quickly. Are indirect and non-confrontational ways to intervene, to de-escalate in a way that's not necessarily saying, hey, this is wrong, but other ways that you can engage with somebody when you notice something's wrong. So what are some of these indirect or non-confrontational ways that you can intervene? Mm. Could you give us an example of a situation? Yeah, I can also just give you an example of like a way that would be helpful. We're gonna go over lots of situations later, so I don't wanna use them all now. <laughs> um, one way that you might be able to do that is just walking up to someone and being like, oh, hey, how's it going? And just talking to them, like you know them. Chris likes to talk about this when he discusses bystander intervention methods, his favorite way. I am so sorry. I was saying goodbye to Olivia. <laughs> Bye, Olivia. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so sorry. Uh, what what do I what do I like to talk about? When we talk about bystander intervention, you always talk about your favorite way that you like to just kind of non-confrontationally acknowledge that you see what's happening. Oh no, I do that without realizing that I'm saying it that often because I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me what I'm okay. what I've said. Okay. Well, Chris, I'll tell you what you'd like to do. Yeah, <laughs> um, please. You have told us in the past a couple of times that you're one of your that, like favorite ways to do it is just to stare oh yeah just to yeah. watch what's happening right um yeah it's absolutely i mean i i guess i don't think of that too much as non-confrontational uh but i stare hard uh but yeah being just letting somebody know that they aren't doing this with nobody paying attention has an incredible impact on the interaction that's happening. Uh, it can be embarrassing. Most people who are, especially in IPV situations, most people who are um, losing control of a situation to where they're doing it in public uh, get embarrassed pretty easily about that. And so staring, keeping an eye on them, letting them know that you're watching, while it comes from a place of privilege in my case, I'm not, I'm not too scared of most people uh, physically reacting. Um, so you can. work out a lot. You got your ready to fight. Right, right. It doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't scare me. Like I'm not gonna say that. I, I, it wouldn't hurt to get hit, but like it's just not something that I'm naturally too worried about. Um, so it's yeah, it's incredibly useful from my perspective, and I recommend people with who have that same kind of privilege in society that that place where they're not as worried for their safety, whether it's because they're a man, because of training, because of whatever status they hold, this is a good, this is a good method to not be too confrontational and still potentially de-escalate slash intervene in a situation. Yeah. 
I it. also like to loudly make fun of Annie. <laughs> and that draws all the attention of the room to Annie, who then mm-hmm. just starts being Annie. Do I need to intervene yeah. here? Are we okay? <laughs> oh, no, this is a valid method. This isn't me picking on her. I, I've done this before. It, it eases the tension of everyone except Annie. Yeah, but that's okay. Um, I, I think another way would be if like there's an IPV situation, just doing something to like break up the tension, like walking and being like, hi, sorry, um, I lost my keys. Can you help me find them? They're somewhere around here. I wouldn't normally ask you. And then just something where they kind of like have to break off for a few seconds in that um, or yeah, bringing some sort of outside, like literal outside distraction into it. Um, yeah, honestly, anything that takes the attention away, even for a split second from whatever is happening in that situation can be enough to kind of help someone like realize like, oh, there's like, this is happening around me and a way that you can talk to the person who's being harmed be like, hey, do you need help? Or even just offer them resources if you were to feel comfortable doing so. But the very least, if you're drawing the attention away from whatever is happening, the situation, that at the very basis is intervening to at least make them take a break from whatever they're doing. So how can distractions be effective interventions? I guess I just kind of talked about that. (laughs) Any other ideas? Well, so it can be effective in a couple ways. If it's a if it's a distraction that just like so, for instance, my staring thing can be a little bit of a can be a distraction, um, an indirect distraction. But at the same time, it, it it says what I said earlier, right? Like it it lets somebody know that they're being watched. It's a little embarrassing, and embarrassment, especially in public can become a bit of a uh a bit of a um sorry i'm watching the chat and the timing that everyone has to leave uh embarrassment can become a disempowering moment so if the if the confrontation is rooted in power and control uh embarrassment is inherently disempowering um thus the the problem the so i'm going to skip to your next question here just yeah, a little bit because we're it, talking it. about it um the disadvantage of that particular one is that's one that puts somebody at risk later right like being embarrassed in public especially in an ipv situation can be very can can take a while um like it can be a slow burn until somebody gets to private and they can take that out on another individual i'd say that annie's example is a really good way it might not be as effective in stopping what's happening necessarily right in front i'd say that that's a disadvantage of it um, because somebody could just ignore that a lot easier um but if it's not ignored it doesn't it has less likely re less likely to have repercussions down the road or later on in the day. Yeah, definitely. I wonder too, with the staring um, and drawing attention, if that might cause the person who's like being abused in that situation to also feel very embarrassed. Um, that like, especially if the abuser isn't, doesn't care, then there could be this, um, like this feeling of like, oh my gosh, everybody's staring at me. They. I'm that woman or I'm that man right now. Yeah. And- yeah, there's absolutely potential for that. Absolutely. It has to be a very particular situation and verging on volatile before that comes up where safety is a risk, if that makes sense. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're going to move on to the next one just for sake of time. Hopefully we can get Annie for a few scenarios. Uh, so direct. What are some ways to directly intervene? walk up to them and say, hey, knock it off. Sorry, yeah. I want to get to the scenarios so Annie has a couple. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and this one, I guess, would probably be the most dangerous one to, to go about doing. Um, but I think especially if you 
are not just like a stranger in that, but a bystander could also be you being a friend or a family member. Um, like it could be your brother is abusing his partner and like you're in a situation in a car or something and you know, you, you're not just like a stranger where it's like, oh, that's none of my business. I shouldn't really get myself involved in it. But it, you know, you should like, if you're in a situation where you absolutely should get yourself and if you have a relationship with either of the people, um, then that could be a really big responsibility that you have to them. Yeah, definitely. And like, it kind of goes one of two ways. You can intervene with the person who's doing the harm and say, hey, stop. This is like, even if it's somebody that you know, and like, that's not okay. You can't treat them like that. You can also intervene directly with the person who's being harmed and completely ignoring the person who's causing the harm being like, do you need help? Let's go this way. Like pulling them out of the situation and basically just being that barrier. And with that in mind, like what are those advantages to doing those sorts of things? And what also are the disadvantages? So distracting or non-direct intervention definitely leads to a place of potential confusion for survivors, right? Mm -hmm. Like that would be an advantage of direct intervention. Basically, basically saying, we, I am here for you. I am physically, like I am involved. I have decided that I am on your side in one way or another. I am somebody who is there for you. Whereas in the indirect way of doing it, you basically are saying you're trying to wink at somebody who's in trauma, that you understand what's happening and you are there for them, but you're trying to do it slyly. And that's not always clear. And what role you're going to have next in indirect, in distraction methods might be, might be unclear as well. Whereas in direct methods, you're pretty clear on where you are and what you're going to be willing to do moving forward. My mom had a uh, instance where she was riding a train from um, Portland to Olympia and behind her there was, a, and this isn't quite uh, IPV, but behind her there was a girl, she said looked like middle or high school, early high school, and a man was sitting next to her and like saying extremely obscene things and like talking about how many women he's had sex with and just like getting really close to her. And so my mom gets up and says, hey, come sit next to me. And then the girl was really grateful. And so the girl came and sat next to her instead. And then my mom went and like approached a like a trained security person and was like, this person is like harassing this girl. Um, and I thought that was really cool because I think a lot of times that like we have a hesitation to do things like that um, and just sort of a mind, mind your own business because there were like a lot of other people in that train too who just didn't really say anything. Maybe it's like rude to eavesdrop, we think, and we don't want to um, put ourselves in that situation. But I thought that was a really good example of this. Yeah. Definitely. That was a really good job on your mom. That was a good intervention. Yeah. And what are important things to keep in mind when you're directly intervening? What was something that maybe keeping in mind in that situation for your mom might have been important, but that she did keep in mind? I can't answer that for you, Annie. Yeah. No, I know. I'm just I'm thinking about that one. Yeah, we'll and you don't have to answer for here. her, but even just um, like if you were in a situation, if you're intervening, what what do you keep in mind if you're going to directly intervene? If you're going to say, hey, that's not okay. Or, hey, I we're going to go over here. Like the like location you're in where there were other, like if it did escalate to something where there was like physical violence or real danger that there were other people there who would have a breaking point for when they stepped in. There's also like security on the train, people whose jobs it was to step in there. Um, and just being aware of like who's around you and what's going on and what you can do and who you can reach out to things are going badly with that. Yeah. <clears throat> and then important things to keep in mind when directly intervening is that your help might not be, your help might not be wanted 
and it might not be appreciated at the moment. Um, one thing to always keep in mind, is, and if we're coming back to the IPV portion, um, is that relationships are complicated and difficult and love is complicated and difficult. Um, so if you decide that safety is paramount and you need to directly intervene and you feel like you've done it in a way that's smart, that's useful, that gave somebody an opportunity they might not have had without you and you're met with something less than gratitude, that's, that can happen. That happens a lot. Um, you're having to make quick decisions and you might not have made the one that the survivor or the person that you're trying to help wants you to make in that moment. So an important thing to keep in mind when you decide to directly intervene is you are putting yourself out there and there's potential that that's not gonna be received like you would like it to be. Yeah, definitely. These are all really good points. I think with that, like keeping safety in mind, of course, your safety, their safety, and like future safety, what repercussions could be happening that they might not want help, that maybe they're embarrassed in that situation. They might not appreciate the help and it might not work in the situation specifically. You might say, oh, stop that and nothing might come out of this. And there's other things you can do when that happens. But also with that, just keeping in mind that it, you're gonna make mistakes, kind of like what Chris was saying, you're not gonna be perfect. You're really relying on your instincts, on the things that are at the very root of you. You're just gonna be doing what you think is right. And that might not be what is best in the situation. And that's totally okay. And you shouldn't hold that against yourself. And then the last thing that we have here, delegate. So what are some ways to delegate the intervention? And we've talked a lot about this already. We've brought it up in a number of ways. So hopefully you have some ideas. Calling the police. Yes, great job. I took the easy one, Annie. You take the harder ones. Thanks. Um, you brought up one too, Annie, earlier. It's not the police. Hmm. What was it? Security. Oh, Annie, that was a great answer. Yes. Security. Yeah. Well, Authority. This one can be harder because I, I feel like this makes a lot more sense in terms of like a fire or an earthquake or a natural disaster, like somebody who's on like having a seizure or something than for IPV necessarily, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not, I don't know how many other tasks there are besides like, I don't know, actually, I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah, I get what you're trying to say. Uh, do you want me to, you want me to go yeah. first? No, you go. Um, so when it comes to delegating, we talked about safety at the very beginning. If you're in a place where it's either not safe for you to intervene or it's not safe for the other person for you to intervene in that situation, delegating the intervention to somebody who might be able to handle it better than yourself is a way that you can still intervene without diffusing the responsibility and assuming somebody else will do something. If you see that they have a friend with them, talking to them about it. If you know the person, talking to somebody who might be closer to them, who might have more information, going and talking to a faith leader, whoever that is to you that's important, that might be able to have a conversation that's going to be more effective than you will, that's what's important in those situations. If that's better than what you could do in that moment, that's okay. And that sometimes can be calling the cops, and it sometimes might just be asking a friend. That makes One, sense. Another way to delegate would, if you have the option to potentially call the DVS support line that's open 24-7, 365 days a year at 425-252-2873. And having a conversation with a trained advocate with your friends um, about what they're going through. So uh, that's if you're in Snohomish County. I mean, if you're not in Snohomish County, you can still give us a call. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, calling your local DV agency if you have the opportunity to have that conversation with your friend or with the person mm -hmm. the survivor yeah so i kind of touched on this earlier why might someone choose to delegate intervention why might they choose to talk to an advocate instead of doing it themselves expertise yeah not trained or feeling capable in the moment yeah i don't think i could like stop any sort of physical violence as being the i might i would definitely just get myself hurt um 
So, and I, I'm not like a very confrontational person either. Con confrontational. The way you said confrontational was damn near a confrontation. <laughs> nice. Okay. And then what are the advantages to delegation as well as the disadvantages? Expertise. Yeah. Uh, but the disadvantages being uh, some of the systemic issues that we talked about earlier that mm -hmm. exist in every agency, um, as well as the lack of the lack of uh, personal bond between the individual and the system agents. Um, so you can call the police, but even if somebody is pro police, they don't know the officer that showed up to their door. They don't know why to believe to trust them. Um, they don't know what's safe to share with that person. If you get them on a phone call with the shelter advocate, you don't know what role they play. You don't know what they know, how long they've been doing the job. And you, you don't know how important this, they don't know how important this relationship is to the person that's in the relationship. There's, there's just a million different factors that you can't know as a state agent, as somebody who's been delegated to. Um, some of your earlier ones, faith, based leader and, and potential family member kind of solves some of that. Uh, but that's the big one when you're talking about expertise in mm -hmm. subject area versus personal experience. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to some scenarios. We're going to talk about, we're going to read through them and then talk about what you would do, maybe which approach you would take. Let's get to the next slide. No. Annie, are we going to get you for one? I will stay for one. Okay. All right. I don't think the first one's like the best one. So dang. Go to the best oh, one. Let's yeah, just go let's to the best that. one. We can go back. Okay. Okay, let's just do this one. This one's fine. This is the best one, according it's to Liz. Not the best one. No. Nope. Oh, it's too late. It's oh, fine. It's, it's a fine the best one. one now. Okay. Well, your friend recently found out that their ex started dating someone new. When you talk to them about it, they say, they can't do this. We're meant to be together. They're my soulmate. If I can't have them, nobody can. Oh, I really like this one. This is... <laughs> No, not well. It's a great one. For, this is the best one. <laughs> this is the best one, but I like it because it's not like, for some reason in my head, all the scenarios was like, in a restaurant, so like you see a couple and they're like, in the front of it, being like in a very obvious dynamic. But this one is great because it's like a friend and the other person is not in the room and she has time for one scenario so she describes an entirely other scenario <laughs> no, no I'm, just saying, I'm saying that this is a great one but i wrote it myself <laughs> what would you do what would i Why? do it's a great question um <laughs> i would say what do you mean they can't do this but see, maybe I am a little bit confrontational, <laughs> but I would definitely say like a direct confrontation of what do you mean they can't do this? They absolutely can do this. This is within their rights. They, they do not belong to you. Like they're not, you like, they are not a piece of your property. They are a free person with their own free will and they have every right to be in a new romantic relationship as anybody else does like just directly confront er, whew, new new way of pronouncing it directly confront the idea of or like the implicit expectation of possession of their partner yeah definitely that, awesome that was a, a blurb chris would you do anything different or would you do the same thing well generally? so for for this one, it all depends. There's there's a bunch of stuff that's that I'd need to know a little bit more of. For instance, yeah. uh, how long ago were they dating their ex? Was it more than six months ago? In which case, then we're talking about some serious, uh, some significant behavior issues that aren't born of like the passion of a recent breakup, but rather an obsession that's occurred longer than potentially they were together, right? And in which case that might be a scenario where it'd be good to warn the person, the other person, that this conversation is still happening so long after the breakup. Because yeah. um, then I'm thinking safety planning needs to be occurring. 
Uh, I it's funny that Annie identifies they can't do this as the main points that they're catching, uh, which totally makes sense. I'm I'm not, but I I saw nobody can as being yeah. the bigger the bigger thing that I want clarified. What do you mean by nobody can? Is this somebody? Is this person uh, has they have they shown this behavior before? Do they have weapons? Are they significantly? Uh, like, was their relationship abusive or controlling during the time that they were together? Or is this manifesting something else that's occurred since? Uh, but I, I really want clarification on nobody can. Uh, yeah. You know, and what that means. I think asking that question, like asking questions, questioning these statements, this language is alarming, like no matter what, if you hear this from somebody you know, that's alarming. That's an issue. And just asking them questions to make them think about what they've said to get more information, that at the very least can be an intervention, a direct intervention, to be discussing why they think nobody can have them. They're your soulmate. They're not yours. They can do whatever they want. They're a person. But asking the questions to understand why they believe what they believe is important. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Liz, so much for putting these scenarios together. And I know that you and Chris will have a wonderful rest of the conversation together very fruitful um and so i've got to head out okay we're going go back to the first one let's do it this one is like the one that i think we all were thinking of so you're walking yeah. down the street you see someone yelling at their partner as you get closer you hear them threaten to hurt their partner what do you do how busy is the street see the, i don't know these are imagination mm. And that's also where the bystander effect comes into place. Right. Like, it doesn't matter if there's more people there. Well, so the bystander effect, one thing, one thing that I think is important about the bystander effect is the presumed safety is, because that's also part of the bystander effect, right? Like mm -hmm. we all assume that there is safety in large groups of numbers because there almost always is. Yeah. Um, so if there's a bunch of people and you've been trained like me personally yeah I'd probably do a direct intervention um because at this point then it it doesn't matter how well so it kind of sorry I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent so it kind <laughs> of matters so for instance if they thought they were alone if it was a quiet street and they didn't see me coming then that's kind of a different scenario than if it was a crowded street and people were watching because in part in number one that is almost expected right like i wouldn't be shocked if i came across somebody threatening to hurt their partner because they thought they were alone because that's when the threats to hurt oftentimes happen so that might be a indirect intervention that might just be me walking by or like turning my music up on my iphone not playing it on my headphones so they know I'm there and then just kind of chilling in the area, looking at my phone, just being around because they thought they were alone. The abuser thought he had control in this situation and now he doesn't, yeah. right? Like he's not alone. If it's on the streets with a bunch of, or a, a decent amount of people around, then that might be a direct confrontation because things have escalated past the point where most dv occurs mm -hmm. which is in privacy in places where people can't witness what's occurring mm -hmm. so this is a this is almost an emergent situation if there's a lot of people around um yeah. in which case yeah you do kind of you don't necessarily get between two people that's unsafe but you definitely let them know that you know it's a good time to take a step back take a breath um maybe not confrontationally Maybe maybe de escalation if you if yeah. you have that toolkit, um, and talk them down from their situation. Um, but yeah, I guess those are my two answers. Kind of depends yeah. on what the street looks like and what the expectation of the moment was. Yeah, definitely. I think that's important to keep in mind too. Is like people who are abusing someone, like they that is rooted in power and control. And at the same time, it's rooted in their image of being a good person, of doing the right thing. And so if they don't think anybody's there, 
they're going to let that guard down. But if they also are in a place where they think they can do whatever they want, despite what other people think, that's their egos way over where maybe you can, you doing something is going to be effective where you're, it's dangerous for both of you in that situation. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to another one. At a family dinner, you notice your cousin has a large bruise going around their wrist. When you ask them about it, you they pull their sleeve over it and tell you they just fell on it weird. So this is a really subtle example where you don't know what happened. You don't know what's going on. But maybe you're like, hmm. So what could you do? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So um, those who have potentially watched other uh, webinars of ours. I do have a background in shelter advocacy, and I worked on the support line. So I've been I've been at this for quite a while. So my training is going to be a little different. Me personally, uh, me personally, I actually wouldn't address this directly uh, at all, personally, because everybody knows the work I do in the family. So if I ask, if I see that bruise, and I ask, how's how are things with your wife or partner uh, or husband? Um, they know what I'm getting at, right? They're going to know it. So that answer is going to be a little different coming from us, both of us, mm -hmm. than from somebody who's not necessarily uh, in the work, this particular work. Yeah. This would be a good time for the average person, I believe, to... Um, to encourage um, almost delegation, like we're almost getting to a delegation point, checking in with friends, family, your aunts, your other cousins who might know, just see if they have any concerns. You don't have to ask directly. You can say like, hey, how, how is cousin John doing lately? How, yeah. how are the kids? How's, how's uh, his partner? Um, and see if there's any concerns, see if they, generally people will say something like, oh, they've been having issues lately, or I don't know, uh, John's husband is always mad lately. Mm -hmm. um, or I haven't heard from John in a while. So or I haven't sure. heard, yeah, you can look up, yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. you can check in, so that's almost a delegation style of mm -hmm. intervention. You can ask him how he's doing, how yeah. things things are. Uh, one thing that I would do here, pre my knowledge, is, uh, oh yeah, I just the other day I was getting into the car and I hit my shin bone on on the and now, like I have a giant bruise. Uh, I did that on Annie's car a couple of days ago. But right. no, it really resonated for some reason. <laughs> so share an accent, share something that mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I totally know how that works, and then like see what they share see how they hurt themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and then see if it makes sense in your head. Uh, if they're, if they, oh, I just fell on it weird. Most adults don't fall weirdly no. anymore, right? There's yeah. usually a story. Uh, and if there's no story after you share your story, maybe mm -hmm. then we're checking in with aunt and uncles. Um, but the most important piece of this, if you are concerned, you check in with aunts, uncles, cousins, friends who might know John a little bit better, and you do have concerns, make sure that they know you're a safe place to talk to about anything. In, in a situation like this, I would just make sure that they know like, hey, I'm available. Set up a time to go get some lunch, go hang out outside of the family dinner. And you don't have to press anything, just let them know you're a safe person to talk to. And when they want to talk about anything, you're available. Yeah, definitely. This might be a time where you can't necessarily do an intervention as we've discussed. This would be a way to kind of prepare for one. Of right. Building that relationship, checking in with them regularly, like once a week and like having a phone call or going out for coffee, whatever that is for you and your cousin, just checking in with them, building that relationship. So if, and potentially when that time comes that you notice something bigger is happening, you hear something that's a little bit more worrying than this instant and they're willing to talk to you about it you are a safe person to do that with right yeah okay a coworker starts talking about a recent high profile domestic violence case and blames the victim for what happened hmm. 
this one happened a mm. lot right this spring we go to the schools we talk about dating violence and every time it was brought up what was going on in the news and I don't want to talk about it so we're not going to but right I mean, immediately you just make sure you're not following them on Facebook or Twitter <laughs> um, because you're going to get frustrated. Yeah. Um, mm, so I one, know. one approach that you could take in this situation is to directly say something of like, hey, you weren't there. You don't know what happened. You can't be the one to make that determination. It's not your place to make that call and kind of not necessarily stand up for anybody, but just say like, that's not okay. Or also just stand up for the situation and say, you know, that's victim blaming, that's not okay. And just name what they're doing and doing that direct confrontation. And it's also a time where maybe that's not exactly safe for your workspace. If that's not a safe place to talk about it, don't have that conversation then. That's not the time. Wait for it to be a better time or talk to your supervisor about how to have a conversation, whatever that is for you and that relationship is like for you and pre prepare for something in the future yeah yeah I, there's legitimacy there um i guess i guess one place that i'm having a little bit of a grinding of gears with this particular one is i can have this con you and i can have this conversation fairly easily because mm -hmm. we're we're educated in domestic violence and we know we saw a, cer a certain case or certain cases and we can be like oh well yeah of course this is happening that's pretty standard for dv cases but here's what we're seeing uh your average person who doesn't necessarily have that background they can say that they can say like you're victim blaming but then that's that's a potential rabbit hole that i'm not sure does anything other than potentially like create an unsafe work environment or at least a dickish work environment I probably shouldn't have said that in a recording, but um, <laughs> so that's that's my only that's my only little hesitation in the calling out right mm -hmm. of this particular issue because there's gray areas in public perception of DV, even though we can identify like why those aren't actually gray areas. Mm -hmm. um, maybe 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 starting a conversation of maybe maybe one item if you don't feel comfortable another friends you're hanging out with a group of friends and notice one of them go through their partner's phone while they're in the bathroom what do you do in all honesty i'm not sure i do anything personally uh, unless i knew that those were some boundaries that they had uh like if I guess I'd ask, I might ask like, mm -hmm. oh, you go, you go through each other's phones? Rachel and I have, like share each other's, oh, let me try that again. I think again. that's also like when it comes to like marriage versus dating. Right. Like when you're married and all your friends are married or been together for five years, 10 years, whatever it is, they, they're going to share stuff. Like it's totally yeah. fine if I just pull out my husband's phone and I'm like, oh, I need to go look for this photo. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Okay. Right. Got the different right. relationship than if we've been dating for six months and I'm like, he's in the bathroom. Let me grab it. Yeah. So, so yeah, I guess let's go from that perspective. If somebody was in a, uh, hanging out with a group of friends, one of them go through, through their partner's phone while they're in the bathroom and they've only been dating for less than six months. Yeah. Um, uh, you ask, you ask about it and again like yeah friend perspectives that'd be a weird thing to do in front of your your friends anyways if that yeah. was the case um yeah to me that's a what are you doing you guys you guys are already sharing phones that's pretty quick mm -hmm. like you're sharing that information they're okay and then honestly i might bring it up with the partner when they come back like yeah. Oh, you guys are already to that stage? That's cool. Rachel and I weren't there for a couple of years after we were <laughs> married. We didn't have those fancy phones. We didn't have the super smart phones, but uh, yeah. Back in my day, we carried around PC computers. Hey, hey. <laughs> I PC had a stands phone. for personal computer. <laughs> okay. And yes, I had multiple flip phones. I had the original Nokia when I was 18. I had multiple flip phones as well. That's what I was allowed oh, good. to 
good. I yeah. Oh, that's what you were allowed to have. That's the only thing I could have. That's what was available. <laughs> okay. When the razor came out, it was cutting edge. Oh my god. Yeah, I all know. my friends had like the crappy little iPhones. They're like that big, and I had my little flip phone with an antenna, and I was like, so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, I think it depends on the relationship. But yeah, you could kind of do one of two things. You could say something in the moment or both. You know, you could say something to the person going through the phone. I was like, what are you doing? Or you could talk to the partner and be like, hey, I saw him go through your phone. Is that okay? Like, I just want to check in and make sure. No problem. If, if it's fine, like whatever. Don't want to start anything, but just let you should know. Or you could do both of those things and kind of just be like, oh, wow, you're all already there. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Right. And I, I guess like just thinking through it, I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's not the best route to go. But I, I just know myself well enough to know that is 100 percent what I would do if I if I was concerned about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, checking in with them later is a good idea. Yeah. yeah. OK. You wake up in the middle of the night hearing screaming, crying, yelling and banging from a neighbor's house. What do you do? <sighs> Well, I feel like I'm answering all of these first. What do you do? <laughs> Honestly, just based off of like my history, my past experiences, I would not want to get myself involved. I would probably call 911, ask for a welfare check to like go say, hey, this is happening. I need you to go check on them. Like, just kind of like worried about this. I'm hearing these things. If I was a little bit braver than I actually am, if I worked through some of those things and was able to kind of overcome some of those barriers. I would do that on top of it because obviously something big is happening if there are things being thrown around that you're hearing it from the neighbor house, <laughs> um, you're screaming and stuff that call 911 because there's gonna be need to be some sort of professional intervention even if they have a social worker come to do some de-escalation right. and go over there myself and bring somebody with me ideally and say, hey, what's going on? I'm hearing a lot of noise, is everybody okay? But those situations are also the ones where sometimes things are going to be hidden. No matter what you've heard, you might get there. And the person who's doing all these horrible things, who's causing this fear, this screaming and crying, like they're going to be like, oh, things are fine. What are you talking about? I don't know what you heard. I'm making things up. Right. So. Right. I think that, uh, I think that my instinct is immediately probably a welfare check. I don't love going to that, but in situations where it's so outside of the norm, um, it's the middle of the night, you're hearing crying and yelling and banging, especially screaming, crying, yelling. If it was without the banging, there might be some leeway in like, let's check, let's, let's just make sure that everything's okay tomorrow because, you know, some people have hard nights. Mm -hmm. and but the banging the the all the whole thing middle of the night especially a weekday night say it's not a friday or a saturday yeah you call 911 i think and then if you get an opportunity to share information later uh you do so this is this is a hard one and this is the typical one that a lot of people get what do i do in situations where i'm hearing this from next door do i do I go knock on the door? Do I ask them what's going on? Yeah. No, you don't. You, what you could do if you're worried about somebody, uh, you could record the noise. Yeah. Um, have that available for the individual should they need it. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Yeah. I think this is one that a lot of people just don't know what to do. I've been in this situation before and I didn't know what to do. Yeah. My instinct, I just ended up calling not even 911. I called the non emergency number, being like, What do I do? And they're like, Well, you should call 911. And I was like, Oh, right. okay. But I was like 19 in college. I didn't know what I was supposed to do in this situation. Right. And in what's college. that? What's that a little bit of? That's a little bit of the bystander. Yeah. Effect. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Right. Like, like uh, somebody else will take care of it. Yeah. It's literally, and or, even you're trying to do something, you're not sure what to do. And you're like, ah, 911's for big emergencies. Mm -hmm. This. That is a big emergency. It is. And it, it 
I also 100% get where you're coming for 19 year old <laughs> self Possibly. was coming from. This mm-hmm. wasn't like, this doesn't feel like a 911 call because you haven't heard like bangs. You haven't heard like the, well, I guess you heard banging, but you haven't That's heard a like lot. a shot. You haven't heard mm-hmm. like, you know, something's wrong. And sometimes sometimes you don't want to put people in more danger by doing something you're not supposed to, like using the 911 line. Um, yeah. And that, that bystander effect can be at play. If like, you're like in bed, you wake up, maybe you have a family or a partner or whatever it is. And you're like, do we do something? I'm like, oh, I'm just go back to sleep. Yeah. That bystander effect can immediately come in because they don't, they're not processing completely. They don't know what to do. And they're like, eh, somebody else take care of it. That's going to influence you. Right. There's a, this is a big one where there's lots of opportunities because you're in a neighborhood. There's yeah. 15 people who probably could do something too. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's better to have 15 people call and say something's wrong than nobody at all. Yep. Why are interventions important? So this is a quote from one of the websites that their main mission in this organization is to end bystander, the bystander effect of people to intervene in domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, I'm going to read it. While the responsibility for domestic violence or sexual assault lies with the perpetrators of these crimes, we all play a role in creating a culture of respect and preventing violence. And I think that's really important to keep in mind is that while what is happening, the harm being done, is the responsibility of that person who is causing the harm. Like that is on them. It's also important for us to be involved. If you see a friend doing something wrong, you see something that doesn't seem quite right or you're not sure, being there and creating a culture and a space that is safe to share with one another, to talk about this, and even with strangers, starting to work on building a culture that calling people out isn't necessarily going to be this scary, horrible thing, that it's normal, that's going to help end the violence. It's going to help us get to a place where we're able to create mindsets that are better, that aren't going to be as focused on this power and control that lies with these crimes. Any thoughts about why other thoughts about why interventions are important? I mean, I, th- I think that's a, a great, a great quote. And I, I think it kind of covers all the bases. My immediate thought is why are interventions important is something that like we've mentioned a couple of times, it's letting, it's letting somebody know that they have, that somebody sees them. Uh, oftentimes in domestic violence situations, IPV situations, we're talking about a fairly significant amount of uh, isolation in in a lot of cases. And that isolation creates a very easy suggestion that somebody is completely alone. So interventions along with things like or uh, community, organizations doing walks or uh, just flyers or quick questions on on questionnaires at the doctor's office. All these things show that a survivor is seen, even if they aren't seen in the moment, even if not all of them can be seen, like all of them as a person can be seen, we know that they're there and we are there for them. And in intervention, that is like, almost the best way we can show somebody that they are supported by the community um, and that they are worth respect and safety and health. Yeah, great answer. That's definitely important to keep in mind. Like They need to be seen. That's the reality. When you're being treated so horribly and this is happening and it comes to a point where you're not even being recognized as like they're not even hiding it at that point that's horrible to experience that is so traumatic and having somebody recognize that say something do something or even just see what's happening acknowledge it can help you feel a little bit less alone is there anything else that you think we people should know about bystander intervention yeah um so so one thing that I would share, and I do wish Olivia and Annie were still here for this part, maybe they'll be superimposed in later. Um, we should have we should have like stick figures of them for 
times that they're not here just can, voiceovers <laughs> yeah oh like get the masks like we had for vicky but with olivia and annie yeah, and then okay. like we could just like stare at the camera weirdly as annie and then laugh <laughs> hysterically as olivia i love it um but what else should people know about bystander intervention is uh we all not we all but one thing i struggled with personally is like I have a hero complex. I absolutely have a hero complex. And in moments of in moments of extreme stress or just just not knowing the exact right thing to do, it makes sense that even with wanting to be good, wanting to do what's right, you might not always be able to. You might not do what's right every single time. That's okay. We learn, we move forward, go with good intentions, go with your safety and the safety of the survivor in mind. And if if you get a situation where you're not sure what to do and you don't do anything, that's okay. Give us a call and to talk to us. Talk to your local DV agency about what you could have done or what you couldn't have done. We might just say that was probably the best thing you could have done. Don't, don't, uh, as a bystander, don't hold yourself to a level that you can't feel comfortable with. It's just try to be a little bit better every single time. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. We're all human. We're not going to be perfect. Right, right. And That's expect happened. to be human. Mm -hmm. Don't expect to be more than human. Yeah. Nobody is going to be perfect at this the yep. first time that they're intervening with something you're not going to do the exactly the right thing or say the, exactly the right words right one thing one thing about this conversation is before coming in to this webinar earlier this week i had a conversation with our director of shelter operations so she runs our shelter the facility management the advocacy portion all over there we we're chatting about what to do in bystander situations and the truth is this is a hard thing to say it all depends. Mm -hmm. There is no perfect answer. There's ways we can address certain situations. There are tools we can have, but it's not always going to be perfect. It's hard. And she's been there a while and I've been doing this a while. And you can hear in some of my answers previously, this is tough. This isn't, mm -hmm. this isn't black and white ever. So yeah. don't hold yourself accountable for black and white where there it's just shades of gray. Yeah. And I think one thing that throughout us discussing the scenarios is that you and I would do different things sometimes. Mm -hmm. We have different people. We're going to have different relationships to strangers, to our friends, our family. We might feel comfortable doing one thing or another, and it's not right or wrong. Doing anything at the very least is doing something and that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's enough. The fact yeah. that you want to try to do something is enough. Right. Absolutely. And the best thing you can do uh, for bystander intervention, best thing you can do if you can is be there for somebody who asks you to be there for them. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody's not asking you to be there for them, just know that if they do, you will do what you can. That is by far the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. um, so even if it's just, I'm not going to step in between those two, but if she comes over here and asks me to give her a ride somewhere real quick that's something i can do or i can get her some money to do this or i can get him a phone number 425-252-2873 whatever um being available being a safe place for somebody is by far the best thing you can do it's for somebody in an ipv situation so if that's all you can do you're still doing the best thing you can do yep awesome i think that's a great way to round this out yeah. Thank you so much. Well, you thank you, any... Liz. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section below. If you have any thoughts on how you would respond, feel free to do that. I'm going to put our number and our website into the description for this video. So if you have any questions about what you could do or what you have done in the past, feel free to call and talk to one of our advocates. They will definitely be willing to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. And if you uh, disagree with me on something, give me a call. Give us a call. Uh, <laughs> yeah, send me an email and we'll we'll arrange a conversation because I want to hear uh, what I might have been wrong with. So <laughs> cool. 
All right. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. Great job.